mistake of being near I-75 Friday at about 4 o'clock. Nothing but campers and boats heading north, so I think we made a pretty good decision. I'm glad you're all with us this morning. We're starting two minutes early just because uh, it is Memorial Day weekend, and we do want to take a moment to pause and just be thankful for those who served and, and lost their lives in the service of our country. Uh, I've been talking with Joe this morning. Joe is a veteran here at our church, and, and a lot of times uh, churches make the mistake of getting Veterans Day confused with Memorial Day, and, and we, we know that Memorial Day is about those who have fallen. I think Joe even gave me that old standby quote, uh, some, uh, many gave some, but some gave all. Something like that, right? You know that we saying? All, yes. We all gave some, some gave some all. Some gave all. And so this morning we had the flag on stage, half staff, just um, remembering those who've given their lives. We have a short video we want to play, and then uh, we will have our call to worship. But I just wanted to take a moment, if you would just take a moment of silence as you watch this video, and be thankful for those who lost their lives serving our country.
a holiday weekend. We're trusting that right now our Facebook Live is double in attendance. Uh, people aren't able to be here uh, this morning. We're praying that all over Michigan and, and other places at campsites and in campers, there's uh, Wi-Fi. And they're enjoying uh, our service this morning. So if you are, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being here. I'm uh, Don Jackson. They call me PD, one of the pastors here on staff. You're going to hear from our other pastor, Shane, in just a moment. We want to welcome you this morning, especially if you're visiting for the first time. Maybe instead of going somewhere north, you came here uh, to visit relatives. And so you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we have a gift for you. If you'll fill out the information that you were given in the bulletin, the, the program you were handed as you came in, if uh, you fill that out and turn that in at the counter after the service, then we'll make sure you get one of these gift bags. And in the gift bag is a wonderful Oakwood mug. I drank my coffee out of it this morning. Not this one, but uh, uh, it's a good cup of coffee all as well. So uh, thank you for being here. And again, if you don't have a church home of your own, we'd love for you to have Oakwood become your new family. We're growing a great family here. Grounded in faith, guided by grace, going in love, and it's good to be a part of this church. Hope you received the email I sent out. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Children's Ministry Forum during the fireside chat right before the message this morning. But we want to point out right now, uh, before Shane comes with the rest of the announcements, we have a big House of Providence weekend coming up. House of Providence, we've been in on this uh, early on in the game. They're not even moved in yet to uh, the Oxford area. They will be coming by the end of this summer and the fall. Uh, but right now, uh, our church has partnered with them. We provided all the foster care girls in their program, about nine of them, with Christmas gifts and got to take them out to dinner. Had such a great time. Again, I keep emphasizing to our church, please understand and spread the word. In our community, spread the word that these are foster care children. It gets confused with juvenile delinquents. Everybody thinks they're bringing juvenile delinquents who've been incarcerated from Detroit to Oxford. That is not the case. These are young girls who've been orphaned. How could we possibly be angry at children who've lost their parents? And so our community is confused. Right now, House of Providence has spent $35,000 in legal fees fighting Oxford community, not against our community, but there's a group in our community that has risen up and are fighting them coming because they don't understand. And at the, at the best, it's racism. And we do not accept that. And I hope you understand that Oakwood will stand strong behind House of Providence. We believe that these children, the girls... Future, there will be boys, but later in the future there's going to be uh, mentally handicapped children. These are children without parents, and of course it's our duty to do everything we can to encourage them. So we're going to continue in that process the weekend of June 10 and 11. On the 10th is a Saturday, the whole thing is House of Providence working at their new property. The property is only about five or six miles from here, it's not far away. Just on the other side of 24 on Oakwood, turn left on Barber, and you're right there in that vicinity. The old hunt club is where it's at. Lots of things need to be done. We're tearing out wallpaper in the old farmhouse so we can get Jay and Maggie Dunn moved in on that property by the end of summer. If you have a, a, a wallpaper steamer, we need you and your steamer. Uh, if you're willing to go rent one, we need you, your money, and your steamer. So we need a, a dozen or so people in that house. There's like 10 rooms. All wallpaper. Who knows how many layers of that wallpaper. So we got a lot of work to do on that. And then there's a lot of outdoor projects. We need uh, some trees clear that are falling around the pond. We've got a bunch of, of uh, hunting stands that are out in the fields that we need to take down and get rid of. There's so much to do that we can only scratch the surface, but we need all of you. It would be great to have an army of 90 people from the Oakwood family show up on that property. Number one, to let Jay and Maggie and the House of Providence people know that Oakwood has their back. We're in their community, and we love what they're going to bring to our community, and we're going to physically support them, spiritually support them, emotionally support them, and uh, we're going to make a difference. So please sign up. Uh, you can sign up for any one of the projects that are on that table. Get involved with this. We're excited about what's going to be happening there. And then on, go ahead, Shane, come on up. And then on Sunday, the day after, we have Jay Dunn, the, the founder of House of Providence, who's going to be preaching that Sunday morning. We like the idea of us having an emphasis as a church and making it the whole weekend. So Saturday we serve, Sunday we hear from their founder, and then we're going to, uh, just again as a church, I'm excited, I'm fired up about being a church in this community that's saying, yes, we want to be God's hands, feet, eyes for 
orphan children. Of course we want to do that. Let's get them off. Amen. Uh, so excited for Jay and Maggie and all that they're doing with the kids there. I think in the spirit of, of Pastor Don this morning, everybody say demo. Good. Demo. Did you notice all the stuff up there? It's tearing stuff down. That's the fun part of getting things ready for, for things that are coming. You're tearing stuff down, cleaning things out. Uh, let's rally behind and have some fun uh, while we're at it serving uh, that weekend. We're looking forward to that. Lots of things happening, and so I'm going to hit a few things quick. We'll, we'll, as PD said, we're going to mention a few more things as the service goes on. Uh, we had a Discover Oakwood lunch, which is our, our kind of newcomer's lunch or get connected lunch here at Oakwood. If you're new or you're just ready to take the next step, that was scheduled for June 4th. We're going to bump that back to June 25th. We hate doing that, but uh, there's an opportunity coming up with Children's Ministry that PD's going to talk to us about in a little bit. So we needed to do that just for the schedule of things. So if you're interested in Discover Oakwood, you're already registered, we'll go ahead and bump you to the 25th. And we'll check in. Uh, make sure that date's going to work with you. Uh, but if you're interested in getting connected, learning uh, more, certainly you, can, you don't have to wait till Discover Oakwood. If you'd like to, love to grab coffee with you, get connected in any way that you can. Uh, but Discover Oakwood is one of those things we ask everybody to do at some point uh, where we can get to know you, you can get to know a little bit more about who we are and where we're headed as a church, and, uh, and we just get some time together to eat and, and get to know each other a little bit too. So that's coming up on the 25th now. Uh, Soul Fire. Uh, we still have a few teens around here. I know a lot of them are looking forward to tonight. Tonight is the last night of Tribal Wars, and traditionally that means mud pit. I believe that's still the plan. Rain or shine, they're going to be here. They're going to be getting muddy and wet and dirty. Send them with extra clothes. Send them with a garbage bag if they need to uh, to take their clothes home with. Uh, but they're going to have a great time wrapping up Tribal Wars tonight. And this is a big week for Soul Fire. A lot of different things happening. So Tribal Wars wraps up tonight. Uh, then next Saturday, I believe it's 3 to 11 p.m., uh, is the end of the year party uh, here at the church. So that's coming up uh, later this week. And then on um, uh, the 11th, June 11th, is going to be graduation Sunday. And so we need to make sure we're not leaving anybody out. Uh, even if you've got a high school graduate that's not involved with our Soul Fire ministry, we'd love to honor them on June 11th. Uh, so make sure you contact the church office or talk to uh, Bobby Root uh, to make sure that we uh, aren't leaving anyone out. There's just a little bit of information, usually some pictures that we get from you so we can make sure we're honoring uh, everybody, everybody on June 11th. So a lot of things coming up uh, with our Soul Fire student ministry. Make sure uh, that you don't miss out on, on those opportunities. I know my kids, I, I ran down and grabbed a new vehicle that we bought from uh, our brother-in-law. My teens wanted to come back with me tonight because they don't want to miss out on Tribal Wars uh, tonight. So they're, they're here ready to go. Uh, and they're bringing friends with them, so it's going to be a great time. Uh, a number of other things happening, but one of, the, one of the things I want to make sure everyone knows today, today was kind of the day that we needed to get all this out to you guys, but uh, the elders have been working, the financial committee has been working uh, to get together a budget uh, for this coming year. And if you are new to Oakwood, you might not realize this, but last year we switched to a different fiscal year. So our fiscal year now is July through June. Uh, so this is the time of year now uh, where we're putting all those things together. So uh, we've done that. Uh, and there's a proposed budget uh, for you, and they're available on the counter, as well as some leadership profiles uh, for new elder and deacon candidates. And if those elders and deacon candidates are here this morning, I'm going to ask them to stand up. Uh, I'll introduce them to you briefly. Uh, so we got David House, and we've got Bill Taylor. Bill here today. Bill's out of town. A lot of people travel on this weekend. So David House is one of the elder candidates this year. Uh, and then we have two uh, deacon candidates as well, uh, Lance Red. And Tim May. Lance is out in the lobby helping sign up uh, for the SOS project. And Tim May uh, is back here as well. So these are great guys. Uh, they're going to be uh, stepping up, proposed to be uh, new leaders for us starting in July. We've got profiles, sheets for them uh, available. But I encourage you guys over the next week or so to, to grab them. If you, have, if you don't know them or would like to get to know them a little better, grab them before or after service. Uh, give them a ring if you want to and talk with them. Uh, one thing that's important to know is we'll have a, a meeting next Sunday, uh, right after church. The elders will be available uh, in the library. If anyone has questions about the budget uh, or ask questions or concerns about the, the candidates that are being presented as new leaders for us as Oakwood, uh, it's a great opportunity just to stop by. Uh, we really see the, the meeting the meeting that will take place on June 11th after the service really should be a formality. It's not a political process here where we're trying to you know, vote for people we like and shut down the people we don't. Uh, the elders have done a good job of really screening these candidates, uh, but we certainly want you guys to be involved as a church. We want to be healthy, we want to have healthy leadership, uh, so if you have questions or concerns, uh, the biblical process would be first, go to one of those candidates, talk to them. If you have a question or clarification that you want, uh, go and talk to them. If you still have questions or concerns at that point, uh, set up a meeting with one of the elders, Pastor Don and myself, we'll come to that meeting next Sunday after the church as well. So we can make sure all those things are, are addressed ahead of time and we get together on the, on the 11th 
how we're ready to move forward. So uh, you'll notice that we're going to be handing out a newsletter uh, at the end of the service. So I came up here with my hands full. And today we're going to send you guys home, hopefully, with your hands full as well. And the reason we're doing that is just to make sure you're in the loop and that we're communicating as well as we can. Uh, so we've got a uh, main newsletter uh, which talks all about the annual celebration and what's coming up there on the front and on the back is some uh, financial updates that might be of interest to you. Uh, it's been an interesting year. We took a, a, step, a step where we really increased the budget last year, uh, mainly because we wanted to have heating and cooling in this, this room right here where we spent a lot of our time together uh, and some other things as well. We didn't quite have the general fund giving meet all of that, uh, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means that we as elders had to look at it, uh, cut some non-essential spending, and we're in really good shape. Uh, but the information, the updates are in there, and the newsletter for you, as well as proposed budgets. We had a $540,000 budget this past year. We're actually shaving it back to 498 as we head into this next year. So I think you guys will see uh, there's some, there's some uh, wisdom. We're trying to be good stewards of what God's entrusted to us. But at the same time, we're excited. We truly believe that we can have giving above and beyond, that we can be in the flip side next year where we are this year. This year we had a, a budget and our giving didn't quite get there. We believe on next year it'll be the other way around if we continue to give uh, and be generous and sacrifice and serve the way that God's called us to. And so uh, we're excited about all that's happening at Oakwood and want to make sure that you're in the loop and have the information you need. Uh, so look at those, get the budget, get the profiles. Uh, take the newsletter home and then let us know if there's any questions, anything we can do to help you understand that as we move forward. So exciting times coming, annual celebration, uh, the business meeting will be happening after church on the 11th as well. So let's pray about those things together, let's prepare our hearts for this meeting and worshiping the Lord together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We thank you for the Oakwood family and for your faithfulness, Lord. Uh, we see you continually bless uh, us in so many ways, uh, primarily with the people uh, that you continue to add, Lord, as you build your kingdom here at Oakwood. And we just want to be faithful to help people know you and grow in their faith and uh, love you and live for you in this community uh, so that lives change and that you get the glory, Lord. And so as we talk about uh, budgets and we add some new leaders uh, to the mix this next year, that's what it's all about. It's about uh, building your kingdom and bringing you glory. And we pray, uh, we thank you for the hard work of the financial committee, for those that have done some of the background, and for the, the new leaders that you're bringing forward who are willing to step up uh, and serve. Uh, Lord, we just pray your blessing on all of that, that as we go forward, you continue to give us uh, a spirit of unity and that we'd be effective uh, at helping people come to know you. Uh, as we come together this morning, Lord, just quiet our hearts. There's been so much going on uh, this weekend. Uh, as we gather, many people are traveling, maybe spending time with family, uh, remembering the sacrifice of loved ones who served, served in the armed forces, Lord. Uh, we're just grateful. Uh, we're grateful for all your blessings and privileges uh, that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for being here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us. Stretch our legs and worship the Lord.
the Lord has done in my life. And just to give him all the glory and the praise and the honor. For he is who leads us and who accomplishes things in our lives. And to give him the glory for that. And this next song, Bless the Lord, just talks about all the wonderful things that the Lord has done in our lives.
I want to talk to you for just a moment while the offering is being collected. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the annual celebration, and that is coming up here on the 11th. And as we're trying to prepare and get the right amount of food and everything ready to go, we need a head count. And so we're going to try something today we haven't done before. Usually we ask you to put your phones away unless you're using it as a Bible, but today, get your phone out if you would. Uh, while they're collecting the offering, you should have received uh, a little after 10.30 an email uh, from me and from the church asking uh, you to register for that annual celebration. Go ahead and go to the next slide for me if you would, Kathy. It's a very simple process. Uh, in there, it's, it's just a couple of sentences and a registration link. Uh, you click on that link, it should bring you to a page like this. So it just says, these are the good old days, 2017 annual celebration, and all we need is your first name, last name, email, and the total number of people from your family. So only one person per family needs to do this. Uh, but if you can give us your uh, total number of people from your family that are coming, that's going to help us as we finish preparing for food and make sure uh, we have a great celebration here in just a little bit. All right, we'll see how that goes. I'm going to get like 500 emails here in a couple minutes with everybody registering. But thank you for, for doing that. We look forward to celebrating together.
your spirit into our lives. Lord, we know that you are always there, but sometimes we need to make room. Lord, we just pray that you would come into this place this morning and that you would just be drenched in our worship and that you would feel glorified by our worship and that you would be lifted on high by our worship.
is it, am I on? I don't feel like I'm on today. Is it on? Okay. There's a penny here if I need to pay extra to, all right. I'm going to let the penny out of the pulpit. That's not a good sign. <laughs> Say a penny for your thoughts. There's a second one. Oh, of course. All right. Inflation. Hard time. So it's just, all right. I want to spend just a moment in our fireside chat and uh, getting you and the church up to speed. Before I do that, I just want to thank Shane. We were talking about it this week, and I encouraged him. I said, let's do it. Let's, let's try to get out of Stone Ages and use our technology, and let's get their phones out, and let's do it. Let's have a register live. Let's do it now, because if you wait, you forget. And uh, so hopefully you had your phones. I know uh, if you're not hooked up to Wi-Fi here, then you had to use data. Take it out of your time or something. It bothers you. But we, we hope that you did that. Now, here's the deal. Now that you've done that, turn off your phones. That was not a call to use your phones all during the service today, so let's make sure you get that right. But make sure you do register uh, for that. We're not charging for that annual celebration. There's no fee to come. We just need to know how many are coming uh, so that we can get the, the food ready. Marty uh, and those working on the food. Brian, thank you so much for all you're doing with that team. We have a great events team here working hard. Uh, we just need to know how many of you are coming. So just hopefully, I did it this week. It's a simple what, name, email address, and number coming in your family. It's simple. Shouldn't take long at all. Pastor Shane did say uh, his phone was blowing up. And that was a good thing. I and mean, as many of you did that. Now, I just want to say quickly, if you did not receive an email, if you went and looked at your email and there was no email there from Pastor Shane at 1030 exactly, well, that means we don't have your email address. So how about that, Memphis? Mm -hmm. We need you to give us your email address. If you did not receive that email, then you aren't in our system, and we need to know that we can contact you. So contact the office this week. Let's make sure we get that. Many special thanks. I don't know if you guys notice from week to week the things that happen, things that change. I know that after our garage sale, what a wonderful thing that was. Amazing the money that was brought in for missions for that. But after the garage sale, they started cleaning the spots off the carpet. We've got terrible coffee stains. And so they started cleaning the spots. And I, I, I think we heard from, who, who was it that gave us the tip about the shaving cream? There she is. We had, she was here working. Oh, she worked around the clock at that garage sale. She was wonderful. She's, she's doing everything. And then at the end of it all, she said, you know what takes coffee stains on a carpet? Shaving cream. And I'm like, Oh, that's the one thing I didn't try. I've been on my hands and knees in this worship center cleaning spots since I got here. And trying to get, we've used every cleaner known to man, anything short of acid itself. And uh, nothing works, nothing works. She shows up and says, try shaving cream. Shaving cream works. It's amazing. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we need to shave it later. Uh, but, but I do know the spots are coming up. And I want to thank Jerry. Jerry Medic. He has got the bug. And it's awesome that I don't, I don't want the bug anymore. You got the bug now, Jerry. Jerry's going around getting all these spots with shaving cream. He came this morning and scared me to death. Got in my office this morning and said, did we change the membership rules at Oakwood? I'm like, oh, no. I don't think we did. Oh, we don't want to do a constitutional change ever again. So, no, I hope not. And I, what do you mean? He goes, well, do you have to have a hole in your lip to become a member? I'm like, what in the world do you mean? He said, well, apparently everybody coming in has a hole because they're spilling coffee right out on the floor. <laughs> It's not a requirement to have a hole in your lip to be here. And we want to let you know. We talk about the coffee stains and we talk about trying to update this, but you need to know this. I, I heard from the president of Cornerstone University. He was telling a story about he visited a home, pretty wealthy home, and they showed him their prized pineapple. It was some kind of a fancy art piece pineapple, and it was uh, a centerpiece on their uh, big display case with a light on it and everything, and they're talking about how expensive it was, they got him in Italy, he's telling this whole big story about this thing, and then he said, I got up in the middle of the night, had to get a drink of water, went in the kitchen, and on the way through, I brushed it, and it fell and broke. He said, I thought about just piecing it together and hiding it, and they think that one of their children did it, but he knew that was wrong. So he said, when I got up the next morning, uh, I immediately said, listen, I did the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. I, I, you know, I, I was walking through the kitchen. It was dark. I brushed it. It fell. I broke your prized pineapple. You know what that family said? I love this. The family said, you know what? It, it's okay. In this place, people are more important than things. And I love that. So I want to let you know, if you've ever spilled coffee, don't feel guilty. Understand that you're more important than our floor. And I hope Oakwood always remembers that. I hope that we will always celebrate that people are more important than our problems, more important than our stains. Matter of fact, every stain we see, Jerry, every stain that drives us nuts, it reminds me there's people. And we all uh, need grace every once in a while. So we're thankful for all of y'all, even if you have holes in your lips, okay? <laughs> that was really a golf clap, so I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> 
want to just point out for our fireside chat today about um, the children's forum next Sunday. Uh, we were kind of hit with a blow at the end of the year. Uh, we lost our commander in Awana, and our game time leader in Awana, John Peterson, has been doing it for years. He's moving. They're moving down south. And so we're losing our game time leader. And uh, Melissa Hall has been doing the record keeping for, what? what's that place called? The, the, it's the older kids. Truth and Training. She's been doing that, and it's a lot of work. We're just losing people in key positions, and that kind of makes us as elders say, oh, my goodness, we need, we need to talk about this. We need to make a decision. Friends, you need to hear your pastor's heart here today. Hear your pastor's heart. We don't want to do anything in ministry at Oakwood unless we can do it with excellence. Excellence is one of our priorities here at Oakwood. We need to do things well, not just do things. We need to do things well. So I'm going to let you know very honestly, very candidly, we need to make decisions about what we're going to do this fall. If, if we cannot do it one or well, we're not going to do it just to do it. And so with that in mind, we know we're going to two services and there's a lot that needs to be done to beef up our children's ministries on Sundays. We've got a nursery. Heard this morning from our nursery that the numbers are declining in uh, volunteers in our nurseries. Uh, Laura Red, we appreciate Laura Red for the many years of service she's given, but she tells us constantly the number of people serving in Sunshine Park has continued going down and down and down. They're, they're, they're left with a, a few frozen chosen or whatever we want to call them. There's not many uh, working down in Sunshine Park for Laura. I don't believe for a minute we don't have the people. Understand your pastor. I have faith and confidence. We have the people. But, but we, we do have an opportunity. When we go to two services in the fall, we just need to make sure that we're utilizing our volunteer hours the best we possibly can. I believe that many people are saying, I don't want to miss church. That's a good thing. If you, if you don't want to be down to Sunshine Park or you don't want to miss the preaching, I'm not going to complain. I like that. So uh, we're happy that you want to be in the service. Going to two services gives us an opportunity for you to attend a service and then serve in a service. I fully believe we should double in our sign-up for serving when it comes to this fall. But we just need to know if that's true. And we can't wait to the fall to find that out. So we're asking all of you... If you are working in children's ministry or have recently worked in the children's ministry, I'll be at the nursery or Sunshine Park or Awana, we want you to stay after church next Sunday so we can chat. We want to talk. Uh, a lot of times churches just do things and we don't talk. We need to talk. We're a family. Amen? Amen. Okay, don't be doing that. You already gave me a weak golf clap. I said we're amen. family. Amen. Amen. All right. I know some people are gone this morning, but I need you to be with me here. Because we're a family, we're going to talk. Do not show up at that meeting ready to spit fire. There's no spitting fire. There's no reason to spit fire. We haven't made any decisions. We need to talk. We need information so that we can make a decision. And so at that meeting next week, we just need to find out what are we going to do as a church going forward. We know we're not doing ministry unless we do it with excellence. If we don't have enough people to do Sunday mornings well and Wednesday nights well, then we need to make a choice. Are we saying that, that we don't like Awana? That's not what we're saying. I grew up in Awana. I'm an Awana child. I spent hours on the Awana circle. I still have calluses on my feet from running to the left around the circle my whole life. Never been in Awana. That's a key staple in Awana. I love Awana. I learned verses in Awana. But I want to tell you from a pastor's heart, just because we've always done something doesn't mean that's what we should always do. We need to know what we've got as a church. Who's ready to step up? We can get excited if we find out that, that we're going to double our staff for the nursery and Sunshine Park on Sundays, bring new vitalization to it, bring some excitement to that. We, we understand that many of you are not utilizing Sunshine Park. You'd rather have your children in here. We need to know why. We need to know what we can do to make that an excellent opportunity for you and your children. And the people aren't here yet. So would you stay next week? We'll offer you some sloppy joes and chips and something to drink. But if you've got children, if you serve then come and talk with us, all right? And again, I've been around the block way too many times. Churches start getting nervous. They start thinking there's something in the works. There's nothing in the works until it works at Oakwood. You hear us? We love you. We love God. We love children. We want to do everything we can to be everything we can at Oakwood in this community. What does that mean? It means we need to talk. And we need to get this right. So I'm excited. I think of it as an opportunity, not a problem. So let's... Let's get it right and let's, let's move forward. Next Sunday, uh, Pastor Shane said he'll try to send something out so that if you plan on coming, so we can get a little head count, we know how many Sloppy Joes to make. But that's the beautiful thing about Sloppy Joes. It's like the 
breaded fish in the Bible, it just keeps multiplying. So. <laughs> All right. We've done a lot of talking today. There's been a lot of extra things. We want to get to preaching. All the things we do, and the most important thing is right here. Preaching and teaching the Word of God. And may the Word enter your hearts today, change you from the inside out. Let's pray. Would you pray this prayer? Would you say, God, if there's anything you want me to hear this morning, I'm willing to listen. God, if there's anything you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. God, may you be glorified. May these people who are here today and those watching via Facebook, may they be edified. Father, may Satan be horrified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of the Gospel Project, friends, and we moved into the, the Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. God, the Judge. I'm not sure about it. There's that car called the Judge. Isn't there your car, motorheads? Where are you at? There's the Judge. I wonder if they got that idea from the book of Judges. There's a lot of neat things happening in the book of Judges. We get to skip right over Ehud. It kind of makes me mad. Anybody know the story of Ehud? Love the story of Ehud. The, the judge from God who hid the... He was left-handed. How many of you are Southpaws? Any Southpaws? Y'all love this because there's a Southpaw in the Bible. He hit a sword in, in his right thigh and went into this evil king and got everybody to go away. And he draws out the sword and he kills this wicked king. It's a great story. Some of you are like, oh, you're a little dark, but you know, I just love a guy. I love Braveheart and all that kind of stuff too. And I love that story because the Bible is so blunt. The Bible says the evil king was very fat. I like it when the Bible says things like that because it only makes you imagine when the Bible says he was very fat. He must have been very fat. And sorry if that's not politically correct. He was skinny challenge. But uh, Ehud, God's judge, snuck in there, drew his sword and left him. The Bible says he gutted him. And he said, it's awesome. The Bible says the sword went in, all the way through the scabbard, into his fat. And he pulled his hand out and left the sword in there. If you don't read the Bible, friends, let me tell you, you got to read the Bible. Read the Bible. It's exciting. It's full of adventure and, and history and, 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 and scary, weird stuff sometimes. It's exciting. So they skip right over the fun stuff. And now we get to a great passage about a judge in Judges chapter 4. This morning, the big idea, everybody say, what's the big idea? What's the big idea? It's calling, conviction, and courage. God directs the right people to do the right thing at the right time. Friends, I believe in a holy God that does the right thing. And He uses the right people at the right time. And God's in charge of these things. He works all things together. For the good of us and for all good, God does make things happen. And in Judges 4 and chapter 5, we're going to see this today. The memory verse for today is Judges 5.31. It's part A of that verse. May all your enemies perish, O Lord, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. Have you ever felt the sunshine on your face? Felt the warmth of its embrace? Sometimes that's how I feel when I'm with you. That's a great song. Judges 5.31 talks about those that love the Lord. Are you being used by God in service around you? Are you being used by God this morning? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how strong you think you are or how limited you think you are. The question simply is, are you allowing God to use you? This morning we're going to learn God uses people. But first we've got to look at the spiritual meltdown that happened in Israel. Let's start by reading Judges 4, 1-3. Judges 4, 1 through 3. You've gone through a couple of judges already. It's a sad repeating cycle. Ehud died. Remember Ehud killed that evil king? That was awesome. As soon as Ehud died, Israel stopped serving the Lord. Then a new judge came. And Israel served the Lord. And as soon as he died, Israel went back to serving false gods. It's a continual cycle of, of making bad choices. And so here we are in Judges chapter 4, 1 through 3. And the people of Israel again, everybody say again. Amen did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after he had died. And the Lord sold him into the hand of Judah, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Heroshim. <laughs> you know, you think I know what all these words how to say them, but I know you don't know, so if I just fake it, you won't care. <laughs> then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron. 
And he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Well, here we are again. Boy, shouldn't we learn? Shouldn't we learn from mistakes? I always pray that we will be wise enough to learn from others' mistakes and not have to do them ourselves. Oh, that God would save you from making the mistakes that others warned you about. I'm not afraid to share my testimony because I want young people to know there's a better way than being weak and self-absorbed and choosing drugs and alcohol. There's a better way than that. Avoid the pitfalls and tragedies that I made as a young man. So I hope you learn from mistakes. Israel continually fell away from the Lord. Remember last week the word was abandoned. Remember that? They abandoned the Lord. Here they are again, abandoning God. What do we learn in these first three verses? Take notes if you'd like to. They're in your bulletin that you were given. We see corruption. Again, they went and served false gods. I must remain pure. This morning I want to challenge you. Are you remaining pure? Keep yourself pure. Don't run to false gods. Remember, how do you start that process of running to false gods? You start by forgetting God. So don't forget God. Every day when you wake, every night when you go to bed, remember the Lord. Remember Yahweh. Keep your ways pure. You must remain pure. Second thing we see is correction. In Judges 4, verse 2, we find out there's an evil king, and he's got an evil army general, Sisera. That army general has 900 chariots of iron. And he ruled over Israel with fear. I mean, they, they, they terrified Israel for 20 years. 20 years. Correction comes. I must receive God's discipline. Do you know when we sin, God does discipline us as we go? If you're a believer, if you've given your life to Christ, then you need to understand this. God has given us a deposit. When Jesus left, He gave us a deposit. We understand that in Michigan. We get 10 cents for every pop can. And we save those pop cans, we take them back, and we want our 10 cents back. When Jesus said, I'm going to give you a deposit inside you, the Holy Spirit. He's a deposit. Until I return, you have Him. And that deposit is a guarantee that, number one, He's coming back. The bridegroom's coming back for the bride to church. Secondly, that Holy Spirit convicts, chastens after us. When you were a child and did something wrong, wasn't it awful when you got in trouble? It was awful when I got in trouble. My dad was a godly man. He was never a pastor, but he was always chairman of the board at the church. He was a, he was a man that served God, and he was powerful. And, and he always... The judge hammer came down at dinner time. It was always dinner time. I know when I did something wrong. I knew if they knew I did something wrong, and I knew the dinner was coming, I dreaded it. We'd come to the dinner table, we'd sit at the dinner table, and sometimes he would make us eat dinner. It was like it was like the last supper, you know. It was it was a somber. I was eating, thinking, oh no, here it comes. And we'd finish, clear the table, then my dad would say, Donnie. He'd always say, Donnie, what were you thinking? I hated that because I wasn't. I wouldn't have done it if I was thinking. Whatever it was. He always says, What were you thinking? The honest answer was, I wasn't. I'm your son. I'm dumb as a stone. You know? Jenny just told him. All the judgment, though. But you know what? It's interesting, folks. And it, it, you know it's true. Maybe many of you are like me. Maybe you got that little rebellious streak and you just you know you just. I didn't feel bad about what I did. I always feel bad about getting caught. How about you? Isn't that the truth? Sometimes we feel bad that we got caught. Not that we're concerned about our hearts and what we did. Boy, Israel, you're going to find out that Israel often felt bad that they got caught. But obviously, they didn't get it, that there was something wrong inside of them. They didn't get that, that what they, how they were living inside their minds and hearts was wrong. Oh, so we must receive God's discipline. Friends, I want to tell you, if you're facing God's discipline in your life, if, if you're going through something as a direct result of a sin choice you made, then learn from it. Learn from it. Go to God and confess it, but don't confess it because you got caught. Confess it because you know it's wrong. You forgot God. You replaced God. Confess that. Get that right. Third thing I see in these three verses is the crying. Verse 3. Uh, the people of Israel cried out. Oh, they cried out to the Lord. They cried out to Yahweh. Help! Uh, sometimes we cry out because of the discipline and not 
cry out because we knew we were wrong and we knew we needed the Lord. I must rely on God's help. Have you cried out for God's help in your life? Are you making that continual cycle of forgetting, abandoning God and running to other gods? Are you doing that in your life? Well, then stop. Recognize. Stop the corruption. Accept the correction. And when you cry, cry out for the right thing. And that's for God's help. That's what I see in these first three verses. We're having a spiritual meltdown. Everybody say meltdown. Over and over again. And now we get to the fun part. The special ministry of Deborah. Let's look at it. We're going to read uh, Judges 4. Let's read 4 verses, verse 4 through 9. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ram and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abedon, and Kadesh, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into your, the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Oh, fun stuff in this passage. Fun stuff. I've, I've really spent a long time this week thinking how I was going to handle this. I still don't know how I'm going to handle this. I think we do a disservice to women when we make a big deal about a woman in the Bible. Now, I'm going to make a big deal about this woman in the Bible. But I do think we need to get over it at some point. And I've done a lot of reading and researching, and we get to Deborah as a judge in the Bible, and I'm telling you, I've seen some of the weirdest things. I've seen people take this passage and do weird things with it. I was taught as a young man, the reason why God used Deborah to lead is because it was his plan B. Men failed, and so God had to go to plan B. Can I tell you? I'll use the Hebrew. That's why I'm just, I'm just so over this. Can I just tell you very bluntly, why is it that we think that women would have to be a plan B for God? I'm telling you, God's plan A for a lot of times and for a lot of places is a woman. His plan A, everybody say plan A. I've seen people take this passage and say, well, it was Barak that should have been the, the judge and he failed and so somehow Deborah had to take this by default. I'm going to tell you, that's nonsense. I don't see that in this passage. I think God's plan A was that Deborah was called to be a prophetess and to be a judge. Why? Because she was all that. Simple as that, folks. She was all that. Now when we talk like this, I know some of you are like, ah, the problem is you won't let a woman be a pastor in your church. Listen, let's make this very clear. We've looked at the scriptures, we've looked at the New Testament teaching on roles in the church, and I'm going to tell you, God makes it very clear that He's called men to step up and be accountable for leadership in the church as far as elders go. We believe the Bible makes it very clear that, that men need to step up and be pastors and elders and deacons. Does that mean, and I've said this before, folks, does that mean women are incapable? Absolutely not. I've said this a hundred times, I'll say it a hundred more times. There are women more capable of pastoring this church than I am. It's God's fault that He chose men to be accountable for leadership. It's not about ability, it's about accountability. So can we teach about Deborah being chosen to be a leader and, and somehow that being something wrong against Scripture for what we're doing? Not at all. Yeah, I'll just tell you real quickly. Deborah was not called to be the priest in Israel at that time. That was reserved for a man to be accountable for that leadership position. Could Deborah have been a priest? Sure. Was Deborah the leader of this army? No, she was not called to be the leader. Barak was the leader of the army. Could she have? I, she seemed to be inspiring. I think people would have followed her lead, but God called her.
call a man to do that job. Now, friends, I just want to say, please, let's stop fighting about this issue. And it's not my issue. It's not your issue. It's a biblical issue. God, in his wisdom, just told us there are certain roles that God has assigned to men and women. It should not diminish women. And this passage proves that case. Deborah is a leader. And she led. And at Oakwood, we have women who are capable leaders. And they lead. Are we going to give up the roles and just ignore what the Bible says in other passages? No. We're going, to, we're going to follow Scripture. And we're going to do what God says to do. The way He says to do it. And at the same time, honor women. And use them in leadership throughout the church. We use them in leadership throughout the church right now. My wife would tell you, she's on vacation right now. She's up north. I'm going to join them as soon as the service is done. I'm going to get on the lake. But my wife would tell you that I am the head of the home. But she's the neck. She can turn the head. <laughs> and you know what? God has made me accountable. Hear me. Hear my heart, folks, today. God has made me accountable as a leader in my home. Does that mean Julie can't lead? No, she's an awesome leader in my home. She's an awesome shepherd in my home. She notices when Josh needs shepherding. And she shepherds well. But did God give her that role over me? No. But do I appreciate her and her leadership and her shepherding ability? Absolutely. So this morning, I, I know this is one of those touchy subjects, but I just want to say, at some point, the Bible teaches us the last will be first and the first will be last. And we talk about all these positions and nobody's happy until we have all women pastors, all women elders, all women deacons, all women all the time. And you know what? That's Satan's plan because God, Satan hates the men to be men. Satan has been destroying men in the church for centuries now and diminishing the role. And I'm telling you, it's sad when we see SOS crowded with women showing up. It's a wonderful thing. We love having women there, but where are the men? And God knows that men will always resign themselves and take an under role. God knows that men won't step up and be leaders because it's easier for us to hide. It's easier for us to just give it to somebody else. And you know what? So God, in His wisdom, made roles. And I wish we could just get past thinking that it diminishes women. And it elevates men, and men, men are going to suppress women. It doesn't have to be that way. Let the Bible speak as the Bible speaks. And the Bible said Deborah was an incredible woman. And God used her to lead. Amen to that. Did that change his plan? No. Did that change the roles? No. Oh, that we would appreciate God's wisdom and submit to God's wisdom and understand it doesn't diminish anybody. So let's enjoy the special ministry of that What was her position? She was a prophetess and a judge. She was so wise and caring that people came to her. She was set up under the palm of Deborah. I like that. There's a tree named after her. She just set up underneath her palm tree and people knew to come to Deborah because she had wisdom. Women have godly wisdom. Can I tell you folks today, I don't know why we should struggle so much with this. There's never anywhere in scripture that says that women have less than men have. As far as I can tell, that the spiritual gifts given are given to the women and to the men. The same Holy Spirit is given to women as to men. So why should we be surprised that women can lead in certain ways? Women, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to lead and lead. If you're empowered uh, to speak truth, then speak truth. Well, let's, not, let's not get this wrong today. Let's understand the special ministry, the position that God put Deborah in as plan A. Everybody say plan A. It was her position. I must influence others for God's glory. Men, you must influence others for God's glory. But women, you also must influence others for God's glory. Has God called you to speak out and to stand up and to lead? Then lead in that way. We all must influence others for God's glory. Beyond position, there's prophecy. She was a mouthpiece for God. She spoke truth. Can women speak truth? Yes. Yes, women can speak truth. Can women look at the Bible and, and understand it and study? Yes, absolutely. There's nothing that women can't do that a man can't do. But it's God who gave the roles, not us. So she spoke the truth. People would come to her. A, a judge kind of acted as uh, the dispute settler in the family of Israel. So they'd come to Deborah to settle their disputes. 
The fact that she was a prophetess meant that she spoke out when God was telling her to speak out. She would give, the Bible wasn't printed yet, it wasn't completed, the canon wasn't done, so God used people, judges, this time Deborah, to speak truth. And we find in this passage, she went to Barak, the leader of the army, she spoke truth. Did not God say? But she spoke truth. And then we got a predicament. I must respond in faith. Here's where they get the passage wrong. As I see it. Barak. By the way, Deborah means bee. I like that. She's busy as a bee. Any Deborahs here this morning? Did you know that's what your name meant? Bee? Deborah's busy as a bee serving the Lord. And I love that. Barak means lightning bolt. Have we heard that before? I think we had a president of that name. Lightning bolt. Now you can search your own joke if you want to. I thought of a ton of thousand of them, but I won't use that name. Barak. The lightning bolt. Deborah goes to Barak and says, you're not doing what God said to do. You're supposed to gather 10,000 men and go to war against Sisera. Remember Sisera? 900 iron chariots. Pretty oppressive. Remember Israel doesn't have weapons. There's very few weapons. These armies knew what they were doing. They would kill the blacksmiths. They would kill all the, the people who knew how to make swords. And they would steal all the equipment for making. And so Israel has really not very much weaponry. And you've got a, a, an evil king with a, 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 a Sisera who had 900 chariots of iron. Powerful. That's a, that's a big deal. So what, what do we have here in this passage? Deborah goes to him and says, Did not God say to go to war? Barak says, Yes. I won't go unless you go. Now, a lot of people look at this as where Barak failed. He did not have faith. I'm going to say nuts to that idea. Here's what I see. The Bible doesn't tell us that Barak failed here. It didn't say that he was wrong in doing this or very weak in doing this. It, it does kind of tell him he's not going to receive glory on his own for just doing what God said. It, that's going to go to a woman, and I'm happy he does. But Barak did what I think I would do. Deborah is God's mouthpiece. Deborah is God's presence over Israel at this point. And Barak's like, I've seen the history of Israel. And when we go to war without God, we die. And so you know what Barak did? He, I think he's one of the wisest generals of all time. Barak says, I don't care who gets the credit. I'm not going unless you come. You're God's presence, and so you go. God's coming. Let's go. So I'm going to flip this on its head and tell you, I don't think Barak was wrong or evil. I don't think that's why Deborah was a leader in Israel. I think she's plan A. I think Barak is plan A. And I think Barak was saying, I'm not going unless God's going. Because it always ends up bad when God doesn't show. So they go to war. I must respond in faith. I believe Barak did respond in faith. He wanted to ensure that God was there and he was going to go. He was going to take the troops. So what do we have next? The supreme moment of victory. Let's read the rest of the passage. Then Deborah arose, went to Barak. Barak called out the Nebulon and the Nephtali and Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels. And Deborah went with him. Now Heber, the, the Kenite, had separated from the Kenites and the descendants of Kohab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent far away as the oak in Zin I really need my glasses, this is terrible. In Zenidim, which is near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abnon, had gone up to the Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and the men who were with him up to the river of Kadesh. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went up from Mount Tabor, 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army of that word. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Victory. You see what happened there? It's an amazing story. You've got to read the psalm coming up next. The psalm coming up next tells us what actually happened. What happened was Sisera is looking down and he sees Barak with 10,000 men down in the valley in the low country. You know in war, if you've got the high ground, you've got the good ground. So he's looking down and he sees 10,000 men. Now what would have happened? What would have happened if Barak said, you know what, let's only take 300 men. Let's not take all 10,000. Well, I think Cicero would have looked down and said, you know what, leave the iron chariots here. Let's just go down and kill them. 
So instead, in God's wisdom, he says, take out 10,000, put them in the valley. Why? Because Cicero looked down, saw 10,000 army below, the whole army below, and said, oh, let's take all the chariots and all the weaponry and let's go crush them. The beautiful thing we find out in the song that's coming next is that God sent an earthquake. And God did some things in the valley because the river had flooded. And when you take 900 chariots from the high ground down into the valley, guess what? You're sunk in mud. That's exactly what happened. God baited them out. They came down that, that into the valley with those 900 chariots of iron. The Bible keeps on pointing out they had iron chariots. Well, iron chariots sink. Just had a guy, we had a, a man move into property behind us. We had beautiful acreage behind the house. This big open field that Orton Mill had bought for the school that they couldn't build the school. So just open field. Last year we saw a car driving out there. Julie said, oh no, somebody's going to build back there. We're hoping they weren't going to build a bunch of houses. So, so Julie said, you got to go find out what they're doing. Go meet them. So early this spring, I saw the man drive out in his truck, and so I ran out to the field, and I said, hey, my name's Don, and I live here, and who are you? His name was Adam. Good biblical name. I met Adam. We talked, and he said, you know what? I'm building a barn in 2019. We're going to have some horses. We're like, no houses, just horses. I love horses. <laughs> trees. He had all these teenagers out there planting trees everywhere. So it's kind of beautiful tree. We're inside. Woo so I told Adam, I'm like, Adam, I don't know if you met any other neighbors, but if you need anything, you can just come here. He lives actually across the street, across uh, the road, and so he's got this land behind our house. And I said, hey, Adam, if you ever, if you just need to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water, just come to this house right there. I told him I was a pastor of this church. I told him I'd help him in any way I can. The next day, knock, 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 knock. Adam's at my door. Julie comes and gets me. I just got out of the shower. And Julie came and got me and said, hey, Adam needs you. His truck is stuck. See, Adam got out in that field and didn't know where all the low spots were. He buried that truck to its axles. I just got clean. <laughs> but the day before, I said, Adam, if you need anything, just come knock in. I got some clothes I ran out there. Adam looked at me and said, I bet you didn't think it would be that fast. <laughs> I said, let's go. And we went out there knee deep in mud and we pushed and pulled and yanked and got another truck and changed. We did men's stuff. It was awesome. Yanked that truck. But I'll tell you this trucks sink in mud. And God, in His wisdom, caused an earthquake. He caused the river to flood. He brought the 10,000 army down below. This, this cocky general looked down and said, oh, we got them. Let's take the chariots. Chariots go down, sink in the mud. They got wiped out that day. There's a victory. There's victory. You know what the, the, the key thing in a victory is when the general of one army gets to kill the other general of the other army. That's a big victory moment. But guess what? Sisera got away. Sisera sneaks off on foot. All of his soldiers get killed, but Sisera sneaks away. Let's read that. But Sisera fled away, on in verse 17, on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of the Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent. And she covered him with a rug. And, she, and he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, so I'm thirsty. So she opened up a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand in the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone in here, say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent then and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove a peg into his temple until it drove down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep in his weariness so he died. Man, did I tell you the story about Ehud? It's, the Bible is exciting. It's better than musty TV. It's a ready made for movie. It's an exciting thing. Read this. And I know you might be saying, oh, that's so violent. But we're talking about a, a time of war. We're talking about when God's people were being, 20 years they were oppressed by this king. Again, their cycle of sin, it just goes on and on. But there's a supreme moment of victory. Let's talk about it. First, we must trust. I must obey God's orders. Did not God say to go and fight? Yes, God said to go and fight. So then trust and obey. So Barak said, I'm going. I'll take the men. But Deborah, you're coming too. Make sure God's coming. Trust. Timing. I love that Deborah says to Barack one day, everything's in line, and Deborah goes to him and says, Oh! Oh, women, hear my heart. We need you women, every once in a while, to come around us men and say, Oh! Stop your wallowing, stop your pouting, stop your laziness. Oh! 
All the women in the house say, up. up. Every once in a while, we need women to say, let's go. Let's go. Stand up and let's leave. Come on, let's go. And so Deborah says to Barak, up. It's time. Oh, God's timing is good. I must rely on God's timing. Don't jump. Don't go too fast. Don't go too slow. Trust in God's timing. Often people will come to my office during the week and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't know what to do. And I look at it and I say, that's interesting because I don't know what you should do either. <laughs> Often it happens. I don't, I don't tell people what God's telling them. I don't tell people. Unless it's something in Scripture that I can point to and say, God does say this. Usually it's just, Pastor, I don't know what to do. And I always tell them, well, God needs to tell you what to do. He's not going to tell me for you. He's going to tell you. But let's pray for God's timing. We can pray for God's timing, right? If you're waiting for something right now, you can trust in God, but you must rely on His timing. Third thing is the tent peg. I love my T's lining up on that. <laughs> Jail. Oh, we got Deborah, plan A. Everybody say plan A. And then we've got Barak, who's plan A to lead the army. But you know what? He wanted to just make sure, and so he made sure that Deborah came. And Deborah says, okay, but if you're going to do that, then you just need to know there's going to be a woman who gets victory. So Sisera slips away on foot, ends up at the tent of jail. Plan A. This is God's plan A. He goes to the tent thinking he's got an ally. See, her husband should be with the Israelite people, but he's kind of scooted out to the outskirts. He's, he's kind of cutting deals. He's making little peace treaties with uh, the, the, the wicked king of the other nation. But J.L. sees what happened. The wife sees that Israel wiped out the army and Sisera is the only one left. And you know what J.L. says? J.L. says, my husband's on the wrong side. I better get on the right side. So Sisera comes in and she covers him with a blanket, a rug. And then he's thirsty. He's been running all day. He's been in battle. So now he's tired. He's thirsty. He says, give me some water. The smart woman. And the women are smart. You know what she does? She doesn't give him water. She gives him some milk. Oh, you got a tired guy. Scared guy. I'm the run guy. You give him some milk and put him in a blanket. <laughs> he going to sleep. Did, did she outpower him? No, she outsmarted him. Do you know that the women in this time were the ones responsible for setting the tents? They were the ones that tore down tents and pitched tents. That's one of their jobs. A lot of people think, oh, poor J.L. She probably never touched a hammer. Are you kidding me? She could sling that hammer all day long. This is something she knew. Women are creative because they go to their strength, and this is what this woman did. She said, oh, sister. You just, shh, shh, shh. drink this milk. Is that enough blankets for you? You're okay. 99. <laughs> she waited till he was sound asleep. She knew how to deal with the pegs. She knew how to deal with the hammer. But she struck a blow. The Bible says she didn't just strike a blow. She struck that blow. It went through his temple, through the ground. She took care of business. And what I love about this passage is we see that God gives victory. And his plan A is often women. And you know what? I'm fine with that. I've always known that. And I get a little mad when people accuse me of being sexist. When all I'm saying is I read the Bible and God sets up the roles. But I also see great strength in women. Nothing to diminish them. And God's plan A is often a woman. And Deborah was God's plan A leader. And J.L. was God's plan A. And guess who didn't get glory? Some of you might remember a little passage in Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 as we get ready to close. Hebrews chapter 11, 32. Hebrews 11, 32. What's Hebrews chapter 11? Hebrews. Hebrews Hall of Faith. After speaking about all the incredible heroes... Verse 32, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell about Gideon and who? Barak. Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel, the prophets. But why is Barak in Hebrews chapter 11? Why not Deborah? Why not Jael? Well, God had said, you're not getting the glory for this, Barak. What is Hebrews chapter 11? Hebrews chapter 11 is for our benefit. You know what God does in Hebrews 11? It shows us heroes that are unlikely heroes that are often failures. That are often not everything they should be. Why did he do that? Why, why is Barak's name there? Well, 
Barak didn't get the glory for this battle, but Barak was mentioned for your benefit and my benefit because God uses all of us, men and women, and we're all flawed people. And the point of Hebrews 11 is if God can use a Barak, if God can use a David who sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, if God can use Samson who sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, God can use you, God can use me. Did Barak get all the glory for this? I don't think so. Was he a massive failure? I don't think so. But I think God has plan A's. Are you God's plan A? If you're God's plan A in a situation, then be God's plan A. Whether you're a woman or a man. And if you feel like you're not serving in your capacity, whether you're a woman or a man, the Bible says there's no, uh, uh, there's no Jew or Greek, Gentile, there's no uh, race, there's no male or female in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the same in all of us. The spiritual gifts are the same in all of us. So if you're sitting here feeling oppressed and suppressed, come and talk to me. Because we need women in leadership to lead in their strengths. If you're a man that's sitting by and letting women lead, maybe God's calling you to step up and lead. This is about leadership today. What did I call it? I think the message is called calling. Everybody say calling. calling. Conviction. Conviction. Courage. All of us have a call, male or female. All of us should live under conviction, male or female. All of us should have courage. <laughs> Are you following that today? We end the service with this today. Chapter 5, I don't have time to read it. If I read it, it wouldn't make much sense because it's simply, chapter 5 is Deborah and Barak. Somehow they got together and formed a band. And they started writing music. And when you read it, you don't, you don't think, well, this, this doesn't sound much like a, a song or anything. But it was their way. They wrote poetry. And somehow Barack and Deborah got together and they collaborated. And they wrote this beautiful chapter 5 about how good God was and what happened there. And the victory that God gave. And it's a beautiful song. And I, I just thought about this because I, it was working with my S and M's and V's. And the sweet music of worship. The story of God is told the best in the songs of His people. I want to end today thinking about our songs of worship. When God does something, we should celebrate it. I'm, I'm excited about our annual celebration. As we come together to celebrate what God has done for Oakwood, it's a good thing to celebrate the goodness of God. It's a good thing. Deborah Barak stepped aside and wrote a song, giving God the glory for the battle of the victory. And the story of God is best told in the songs of His people. Music speaks, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Doesn't yeah. music speak? Yeah. Last night I, I drove for uh, four weddings. Uh, and almost the same thing happens. I drive a, a bus for the limousine company at night. And I was driving for a wedding. The same thing happens. The wedding party and all the guests get on after a long night of celebration. And we get driving and then they start singing music. Just a small town girl. <laughs> <laughs> Living in a lonely world. All right, we're going to sing that one. I'm singing just loud as they are. And then the next one is, um, Whoa, leaning on a prayer. Take my hand. I'm singing with that one. And then I thought last night, you know what? They have songs. Everyone has songs to celebrate. Celebrate good time. Oh, come on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> We sing all of them, almost every wedding. And then everybody gets off saying, they're the craziest wedding party you ever had, haven't you? I said, no, you're just like the last one. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot two of my favorite songs. You know, I, they sing songs, but nobody can sing songs like we should sing songs. Nobody writes a song like Deborah and Barack when they see God's hand at work. So I just, I asked Tracy if I could close the service today with your help. Instead of having a man come, I thought it would be good for us to remember the song. This is by no way is anything about contemporary versus old hymns. I just There's times when my old past rises up, and I remember the songs we used to sing. These are songs we used to sing around my house. These are songs that should be sung, and I'm not saying we have to sing these in church every Sunday. I love our music. Today was a great day, Tracy. I love our music. Let's keep singing our music, but let's not forget other music. There's been great hymn writers, and I was just... I was just doing a little walk through my past, remembering the goodness of God and these songs. Father, here, far away, 